So thus far in this unit, we've been looking at gas laws and the kinetic molecular theory which governs gas laws at the high school level anyway. Today we want to look at what makes a gas. For that matter, what makes a liquid or a solid. So if we're trying to figure out what makes something a solid or a liquid or a gas, or if we're trying to figure out what makes something dissolve in water, it all comes down to this question. Okay? If we want to know whether something's going to be a solid, liquid, or gas, or if we want to know if something can be dissolved in water, it really kind of comes down to this question. What is it that holds structural particles together? Okay? Well, I've said this before, but let's just make it clear. Structural particles are any of the basic building blocks. Okay? So if we're looking at a structural particle, if we call it that, for this building, we say it's either bricks or brick or concrete blocks. Okay? That's the structural particle for which, uh, around which this building is built. Some of you have houses that are made of wood. The structural particle, I guess, are pieces of wood. All right? What's the structural particles for matter? Well, the basic building block for all things that are made of matter is the atom. But it's not, that doesn't, that isn't the structural particle that makes something a solid, liquid, or gas in every case. If I have just something that's just a pure metal, like iron, well, in that case, the basic building block of a chunk of iron, say a nail or something, would be an atom, okay? If I'm putting together um, two non-metals to make a molecule, that molecule itself becomes a structural particle on which we build solids, liquids, or gases. Because it's not um, the atoms bonded together that make it a liquid or a, or a gas. It's the molecule where the two atoms are bonded together, or three atoms or four atoms bonded together to make a molecule, and how that molecule interacts with the next one that makes it a solid or a liquid or a gas, okay? If I have an ionic compound, well, because ionic compounds are built on ions, metal, negative ions bonded to positive ions, and those are bonded to negative ions, which are bonded to more positive ions, and it goes on and on and on, making a crystal. In an ionic compound, then, the structural particle is an ion. So you've got to understand what the structural particle is that makes something a solid, liquid, or gas. In every case, once you understand what the structural particle is, what's holding structural particles together, or doesn't hold them together in the case of a gas, what holds them together um, is differences in charge. Positives are attracted to negatives. Okay, that's what's going to hold everything together for matter, okay, for solid liquids and gases. All right. Um, now, those differences in charges might be ions, okay, in the case of an ionic substance. It might be uh, some kind of polarity in a molecule, okay, or in the case of metals, it's um, metal atom slash ions to electrons. Metals are kind of strange in the sense of how we've been discussing attraction between particles up to now. This metal stuff here is something called the electron C model. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but I'm going to explain it to you very briefly. The electron C model, okay? So if I have a metal, we're all familiar with iron. Let's use iron as our example here. Okay. What is it that makes two metal atoms stick together? We know that when we put metals with nonmetals, the metals give up their electrons, the nonmetals gain the electrons. That's what we thought about it. We're constructing in our minds and in our practice in this class, we're constructing ionic compounds. So metals tend to give up electrons, and we know that there's an electron cloud, whoop, electron cloud, for every metal atom, right? Everything has an electron cloud, every uh, atom anyway has an electron cloud. Well, if metals tend to give up electrons, and when we did the 
um, ions and magnets lab, we figured out that those outer electrons are the ones that leave. That's how we figured out whether we had paramagn paramagnetism or not for that lab. Okay? So these outer electrons tend to want to be given away, right? If I put a metal like iron with a non-metal together like chlorine, iron is going to give away electrons to chlorine because chlorine is a non-metal. Okay, it's the one that's more electronegative. All right. What actually happens when I'm putting two metals together is these electrons in the outer level kind of get loosely held. They're not even held, to get held by one atom. They're held between more than one atom or more than one ion. And that's why when I listed it over here, I call it atom slash ions because it's something that's not really an atom, something that's not really an ion. But what actually happens then is between all these metals, if we're going to call them atoms, if we're going to call them ions, the electrons are flowing through here. They're just moving around willy-nilly all through there. Okay. So this is more positive because it gave up an electron. This is the negative part. The atoms or ions of the metal are attracted to the electrons that are flowing. The electrons that are flowing are attracted to the atoms. So the electron C the sea of electrons surrounding all these atoms of a metal become the glue that hold them together. The metal becomes more positive, attracted to the electrons that are flowing. The electrons are more negative, they're attracted to the metal. That's what holds it together. So it's kind of strange in terms of the way we've been talking about everything so far. And that's really all you need to understand about the electron C model at this time. Okay, there are other things we, that you probably need to know in other classes in the future, but right now, you just need to know it is, how it is that metal atom slash ions are held together. And it's called the electron C model. The electrons are free, free flowing. The outer electrons are free flowing, creating a kind of ion attracted to the free flowing electrons, which are in turn attracted to the ions, which are attracted to the electrons and so forth. That makes sense? Yes? Okay. So that's really what you need to know about how those are attracted together. We've talked about ions and polarity before. We know about we know if we have iron, we talk about iron. If iron gives up two electrons, it becomes two positive. Chlorine would gain one electron. So positive charges are attracted to negative charges, and we get an ionic compound. And that would be those opposite charges are what hold ionic compounds together. So it's an opposite charge. Pol polar molecules, let's say we're using ammonia. Okay, ammonia is a polar molecule. Nitrogen is a partially negative end where the hydrogens are down here. That's a partially positive end. And so one nitrogen atom, I'm sorry, one nitrogen, um, I'm sorry, one ammonia molecule is attracted to the next because the positive ends are attracted to the negative ends. Does that make sense? Are you, okay? Again, it's opposite charges. They're making things stick together. Difference in charges. So now let's go to the nonpolar stuff. We said it has to be opposite charges of some kind. How does a nonpolar thing become attracted to a nonpolar thing if, they're don't, if they don't have any opposite charges? Because opposite charges are created temporarily. Let's take a really small atom that typically doesn't stick together. Something like Oh, I don't know. Let's just do xenon. I like xenon. Okay, it's a noble gas. All right, all substances have this electron cloud. Okay, so there's electrons around the xenon center where the nucleus is located. Okay, so xenon, because it has an equal number of electrons and protons, because it has a full valence level of electrons, because it's an equal... It doesn't have any reason to attract to itself. But if you cool it down enough, or you squeeze it together enough, it will become a liquid. What is it that makes it stick together? And that's what we call a shift in electron density. If there's no shift in electron density, there's nothing to make one xenon atom stick to another. Okay? There's no natural polarity, no uneven arrangement of electrons like there is in ammonia. So here's what happens is, these electrons in xenon's electron cloud 
are moving around. They're randomly moving around. Okay, they're flying in all kinds of directions, but they're tending to stick closely to the xenon center because that's where the protons are located. Okay, but let for example, I, let's say I have ten pennies in my hand. I throw them in the air and I'm going to hit the floor. How many heads and how many tails do we have? Five and five every time. No, but on average you would, right? This is what happens on average. Just like with throwing up pennies and letting them hit the ground, sometimes I'm going to have two heads and eight tails if I have ten pennies, right? So sometimes the electrons are going to be grouped more on one side than the other. That makes sense? Because it's random, just like the pennies being thrown in the air are random. Well, if the electrons are grouped over here, this is partially negative on this side. This is partially positive on this side. And now I have a reason for this xenon to stick to another one. So if I have this unevenly arranged set of electrons, this is called a shift in electron density. There's a greater density of electrons on this side than there is on this side. Okay? This shift in electron density can enforce a shift over here. Because this side is more positive, it wants to attract the electrons over here. Okay? And we create something else over here that's partially negative and partially positive and having a reason for these to be attracted to each other. Or, you know, just randomly, it might be that this one already has a shift in electron density that creates an attraction. But it's so rare, there's not much attraction. But if you cool it down enough, or if you push them together enough, you can get them to stick together enough to be a liquid or even a solid, maybe. And the difference between this and iron being attracted to itself is that this isn't giving up any electrons. The electrons are just moving around in the electron cloud. With the iron, with the electron C model, the electrons are actually moving around outside the electron cloud. They're leaving the electron cloud and being shared between all the atoms. Uh, if, on the other hand, and this is a small atom, Okay, nonpolar. Suppose I get a larger atom, or two larger atoms. Like, um, in our activity we did, we had some hydrocarbons that were like five or six hyd hydrocarbon groupings long. Okay, we might draw those out like this. Here's a long hydrocarbon. Alright, and let's put it near one that's another long hydrocarbon. All right. Remember that what made these two stick together, if I made it cold enough or put it under enough pressure to stick them together and make them a liquid, was that shift in electron density. There's more surface area along the electron cloud around this whole molecule for that shift to occur. So statistically, the larger the molecule the more places a shift in electron density can occur, and so the more attraction there can be between those molecules. So the larger the molecule, the more well, they stick together. So that's why larger molecules tend to stick together more than smaller molecules do, because there's more surface area for the shift in electron density to occur. Okay? So it's easier to freeze something or condense something that's large than a compared to molecule that's small. If I got a hydrocarbon that's large, tends to be a solid or a liquid. Got a hydrocarbon that's small, tends to be a gas. Make sense? All right. So there are three big factors, three big factors that go into making something solid, liquid, or gas. Okay. One of them is the size and shape of the particle, which is what we're talking about. Another factor is how fast the particles are moving. Because if they're moving pretty fast, they bounce off. Imagine for a minute, and I've seen, I don't know, I've seen TV shows and videos on YouTube. Imagine somebody's wearing a Velcro suit. You ever seen a Velcro suit? No? Huh? Imagine. Okay, that's what I want you to do. Imagine somebody wearing a Velcro. Now, Velcro has two parts, right? Yes? you got one part that's sort of a fuzzy part, and the other part has a little loop, you know, sort of a little uh, catch in it. Kind of like a fish hook in there. You ever look at it really close? Okay? That's what makes them stick together. Okay? So, so let's say you're wearing a suit that has all the fish hooks 
and he put the part, the fuzzy part up on a wall. The guy goes running along and jumps up on the wall. What's going to happen? He's going to stick. What if he's running too fast? And he bounce off. Same thing. If the ball is moving fast enough, they might be sticky, might be polar, might have a shift in electron density, but if they're moving too fast, they're not going to stick together. What makes molecules move fast? Heat, temperature. The faster you heat them up, the less they stick together, the more they tend to boil or melt and get apart from each other. Does that make sense? Right? Okay. The strength of attraction between particles makes a difference too. Okay, it depends on, let's say he's just wearing a Velcro shirt as opposed to a Velcro suit. Is he going to be stuck to the wall easier or harder if he's got a Velcro shirt and not a Velcro suit? Well, a Velcro suit would stick more because there's more to stick, right? As opposed to just a shirt. Okay. Right. Or just, how about Velcro shoes? Pretty hard to get it stick together, right? right. You can think about that way. You can run this movie as imagining in your head. And you, it makes sense. The factors that make something a solid are the same factors that make it a gas. If they're strongly attracted, it's more easy to make them a solid, more easy to make them a liquid. If it's more easy to make them a solid, it's easier to freeze. If it's more easy to make it a liquid, it's easier to condense. Okay, the shape of the molecule. If it's a large molecule, easier to get it to stick together for the reason we just discussed. Okay? So the larger molecules tend to be, it's easier to freeze them, easier to condense them. The smaller molecules are harder to condense, harder to freeze. How fast they're moving. Well, that's all about getting the freezer melt right there. How fast they're moving makes it, if they're moving slow, easier to get them to stick together. Moving fast, harder to get them to stick together. Does that make sense? That's the theory. That's the basic idea behind this whole activity we're doing. What makes everything stick together? Okay. The only and, and you had you're looking at boiling and freezing point, but you're also looking at whether things dissolve in water. Well, water's polar, so you're looking at whether they tend to stick to the water or not when you're dissolving things in water. That makes sense. That's the underlying theory, in a nutshell. So if you go back over the handout that I gave you yesterday, and if necessary, watch the videos over again. Hopefully, this activity today and this explanation is going to make it illuminate better for you.